So welcome to this evening's People, Place and Community Seminar. Our speakers this evening are members of Historic England's Communications and Public Engagement Group. Historic England is the public body that helps people care for, enjoy and celebrate England's historic environment. Their Communications and Public Engagement Group, um, who are going to be speaking to us this evening, inspire people to get involved in the historic environment to ensure it's valued and protected. They work with people to understand, to celebrate and take action in support of the places they care about. So over to you, Finn, and the rest of the group. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so hopefully... That'll be coming up on your screens now. Um, so yeah, um, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I'm Finn White. Um, we're going to be talking today. We're going to be giving you a showcase of community-driven heritage projects from Historic England. Um, so yeah, I'm the participation manager at Historic England. When we were invited to do this seminar, we thought there's so many projects that fit into this people, place, community kind of theme. Let's just give you loads of them. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and the the format's going to take. Um, we're going to have Ellen, who's going to give us a bit of an overview um of all these different projects um and then we're gonna have gareth talking about missing pieces harriet on high streets cultural program essay on um historic england archives and age uk each of them are going to do a really quick fire five minute presentation um so it'll be kind of quite intense to listen to maybe so we thought we'd break it up you'll have a q a after that where you can ask any of those questions uh, and then we're going to have a couple more quick fire presentations from Emma and Polly and from Sean, and then um, follow that with another Q&A. So there'll be another opportunity to ask any questions of any of us. Um, so that's the format it will take. Hopefully it works. Um, and I'm going to hand straight over to Ellen. Hello, everyone. Delighted to be here this evening. Um, Thank you for coming and hearing a little bit more about Historic England's work. Um, I'm really just going to spend uh, not even the full 10 minutes um, talking to you to give you a little bit of strategic context as to why we're doing the work that we are. Um, and then I'm going to break away from that and give a very quick plug to our national blue plaque scheme uh, that we'll be launching later this year to give you a little bit of an inside scoop around that. So if we can have the next slide, please. Finn. So I head up creative programmes at Historic England um, and work alongside um, uh, several other people that you're seeing here today, colleagues from across different teams, including archive communities and inclusion and our digital content teams as well. Um, so I wanted to just introduce Historic England to you first, because some of you may have heard of us and some of you may not. So the first thing to say is we are not English heritage. Um, we used to be English heritage and then we split into two about six or seven years ago now. Uh, but we have similar names and a shared history and so I always start by saying we don't have any properties uh, but we do so much more. So I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about our remit. Um, as, as Ruth said, we're a government organisation, so we are an arm's length body um, to government, and our remit is really, really diverse and varied. Um, we have uh, a nationally recognised archive and we care for that collection. Um, we grant aid lots of different organisations to help connect people to the uh, built historic environment, archaeological digs, um, research, and also community driven engagement as well. Um, we advise national government and also local authorities. We comment on planning applications that affect the historic environment. We list buildings and schedule ancient monuments. So we care for the National um, Heritage List for England as well, which you'll hear more from Gareth on. And really crucially for this kind of time we're spending together, our remit is also to help the public to increase their understanding and enjoyment of the historic environment and champion that. Um, so we have a really diverse remit, which is all about celebrating history and heritage. Um, our, our mission and our purpose is to improve lives through and protect and champion heritage. And so you might think, well, that's a bit of a leap as to why we're improving people's lives through that. But we really, really believe that we are. And that's our cause, because we believe that through engaging in history and heritage, you can foster all sorts of well-being outcomes from that through increased pride in place, through to um, increased connectivity and sense of belonging to where you are, 
um, understanding different people um, and increases in confidence as well. Um, and then, of course, there's also the economic impact and benefits that our work can bring around. Um, Harriet's going to talk about the High Street Cultural Programme, which in turn is supporting a much broader piece of work, which is regenerating 68 high streets across England. So um, I hope that that just demonstrates that uh, the work that we're doing is working really, really hard to benefit people's lives uh, in the longer term. And um, the other thing that we really want, I want to bring out in this is that um, our vision uh, at Historic England for the historic environment in general, really working with all of you in the sector as well, is that um, we that we collectively have a heritage that is valued and celebrated and cared for by everyone. And that's really, really important in relation to what we'll talk about this evening, uh, because we can't we can't reach that vision and we can't reach the outcomes we're looking for unless everybody feels connected to the historic environment in ways that work for them. So that's just a little um, a little lead in to what we're going to talk about this evening. And um, the other thing that's on this slide is our future strategy. I think that's worth mentioning. Historic England has a future strategy for the next 10 years and it has three pillars. Active participation, which is, as the name would suggest, asking people to directly participate and help shape what we do as an organization and what the sector does as well, what the, his, um, what the historic environment is and who it's for. Connected communities, which is about um, primarily communities really taking part in the future of those places, of their own places locally. But it's also there about um, kind of longer term volunteering and social social action that we might we might encourage people to do. For example, looking after an at risk listed building, or maybe taking on um, maybe taking on an out of use building um, in the form of a community trust, for example. Um, and of course, in this virtuous circle in which we're talking about, all of these actions lead to thriving places where um, the historic environment is really working hard to help places work for people and that they're sustainable in the long term. So that's us in a nutshell. I won't dwell on that too long. I hope that helps contextualise some of the projects you're going to hear about this evening and why we work so hard to um, engage engage people and communities across the country. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please, for me. Uh, I wanted to just shoehorn in the National Blue Plaque Scheme because I think as an audience, you're gonna be really engaged in this. And I'd love to be able to tell you a little bit about what to expect over the next year. Um, so we um, are launching a National Blue Plaque Scheme in, um, towards the end of May. Um, we have been in a kind of pilot stage at the moment. Uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, the Heritage Minister, Lord Parkinson, asked us in September to set up a national blue plaque scheme, which is um, in tandem with the English Heritage Run London blue plaque scheme, which remains with them. But it's about rolling out that scheme uh, across the country and really looking at places where perhaps there aren't plaque schemes already. Um, some of you may be involved in civic society, so I also really want to stress that this is not about replacing the amazing work of civic societies and local plaque schemes there, but rather about working alongside those um, and bringing um, what many people feel um, a London scheme should have always been national, like bringing that to, to everybody. So um, we unveiled a plaque to Daphne Steele, the first black matron in the NHS last month in Ilkley, and that's her son Robert there at the unveiling. Um, we have a plaque to Claris Cliff being unveiled in Stoke-on-Trent next month, and then after that one to George Harrison in Liverpool at the end of May, when we'll also be launching uh, for public nominations. So if you have always wanted to get a blue plaque, uh, for someone, or a group of people, or a significant event, uh, it's a good time to start thinking about who you might want to nominate online. And that's the end of my section. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. Um, we're going to move straight on to Gareth. Oh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Gareth. I work within Historic England, and I specifically work on the Missing Pieces project. I have the next slide, please, Flynn. So um, the Missing Pieces Project, as Ellen um, said, there is a National Heritage List of England. So that's everything that is designated. So listed buildings, scheduled monuments, parks and gardens, wrecks, everything in between. Um, there's over 400,000 different 
entries on the National Heritage List of England. And with each one of those, you, the members of the public, anyone can add a photo, add a story, add a thought, add a feeling. Anything that makes a building special, anything that makes you love that building can be added to the list entry. And that's what's so special about the, uh, the Missing Pieces project. In fact, I have the next slide, please, Finn. So this is going to be a whistle stop tour, so I'm going to have to try really hard to get it into five minutes. So essentially, we could break it down into three things. So as I say, 400,000 list entries, all written at different times by different people in different areas, different counties, different styles. Because of how many people we have working for us, we can't update every single list entry. So one of the perfect, beautiful things about the Missing Pieces project is that members of the public, people that know those areas better than definitely I, can update us and update everyone else and tell us exactly what their built environment, what their local environment is being used for. So you can see here, Trang um, told me, told you, told everyone else that this phone box, no longer a phone box, it's now a lending library, a public lending library. So again, the, the National Heritage List of England will have this um, list entry, it's a legal document. What you can do is update it via these pictures. If I could have the next slide, please. The second kind of way that I look at this is that, and this is the one that kind of resonates really personally to me, is that it enables you to give us those personal um, thoughts, those feelings. So you can see that Georgie here is um, her granddad. This is her granddad's house. She's got these warm kind of stories that resonate with her. They're individual to her. They don't make the building any more or any less listable, but it is this story that is resonates and I think so my nan um, when I used to see my nan she lives in a council estate in Swindon so it's not quite a listed host house but the story the thought the feeling resonates with me so it's something that um, kind of connects with me so we've all got those special feelings and the missing pieces project is somewhere where that can capture that feeling and then Finn if I could have the other one so again it just means that you can add some additional um, information. So platform piece is um, it's a series of statues that are in Brixton on Brixton um, platforms. Um, so Joy here was one of the subjects of the of the platform piece. Um, it's believed that she's the first sculptural representation of a black British person in England. So here she is stood next to her statue. And so it it's not so when um, Charlotte added this photo, it's not any more sort of personal story, but it's something that adds a bit more volume, a bit more color and a bit more texture as to why the platform piece was listed in the first place. I would say that what I love about the Missing Pieces project is that we as an organization, it's about conservation or preservation. So preservation is um, if you stick a glass case around something, pop it into a museum, it never changes conservation is monitoring these things in everyday environments so a building doesn't become a museum piece when it's listed it changes use so if you think about your favorite coffee shop at one point could have been a factory at one point could have been anything these buildings change use and they adapt with the community that they're in so the missing pieces project is just a perfect example of you telling us exactly what you love about the building. Um, you don't have to be a heritage professional. That's one thing I will stress. You don't have to be a heritage professional. It can be to any layer. So I love the fact that you can give some additional pertinent information to a list entry, or you can merely say, this is where I used to go with my nan when she picked me up from school. So it's everything in between. And that's what I think is the most wonderful thing about the work that I do is that I get to hear these special stories. If I could have the next slide, Finn. Again, I'm probably rattling through this because five minutes is really daunting to try and talk about this. But so it started in 2016. I've worked since its inception. Um, we've got roughly 6,000 users. Um, we've got just over 299,000 contributions. So again, 400,000 list entries, they've all got stories to tell. Someone knows something about those buildings that we as heritage professionals within historic England definitely don't know. So that's why we, we need your help. There's 35% of the list, en uh, list completed, but there's always more that can be done. So if you have a look at a list entry and it's got a photo on, please don't be daunted. There's always room for your photo. If 
I'll have the next slide, please, Flynn. So I said there's 6,000. So I think there's roughly maybe 60 people on this call. So if we could have 6,060 by the end of sort of today, maybe even tomorrow, that'd be fantastic. It's a really, really simple process. It will take about three minutes to sign up. So you create an account and then you're good to go. You just search for what's in your environment, what's in your area, and you can add a photo, add a thought, add a feeling, something that makes that area special. I'm not entirely certain how much room I've got left now, but. Uh, you're right. Have you got a bit more to go? I feel I could talk about this for absolutely ages. <laughs> so the thing is, I, I think if you, if we go back to what Ellen was saying about the active participation, connected communities and thriving places. So active participation is the idea of finding what's in your area, what's listed, the going out, taking a photo, someone else sees that photo, it resonates with them. So that's the community. And then the minute that someone can say, I didn't know that that would be listed, or I didn't know that was listed in my area. That's when the thriving places happen because it, it enables people to become active. They, they, they take care and they, and they want the best for their environment. So I think I'm not saying that the missing pieces project covers everything, but it certainly helps with our long-term objective, but to meet those long-term objectives, we need, your photos, your stories. We need everything that you've got that we don't know. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Gareth. Um, great. So we're going to move straight on to our next speaker, who is Harriet. Hello. Um, yes, I'm Harriet Clark, and I'm Creative Programmes Assistant at Historic England. Um, I'll be taking you through a very brief um, overview of the High Streets Heritage Action Zones cultural programme. Um, should we have the next slide? Please. Um, it was a four year kind of funded pro programme of heritage and community led cultural activity uh, running alongside a programme of capital investment, restoring more than 60 historic high streets across the country. And this map shows here all the high streets that we uh, worked with um, across England. Uh, this programme was it was funded by the government and there was an additional three million provided by the National Lottery Heritage Fund for the cultural programme. Um, next slide, please. Lovely. So this is one of our historic high streets in Coventry. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the funding for the cultural programme was split into two and uh, different strands. Um, one was a local grants programme and another a national commissioning programme. Um, so for the local grants, there was uh, cohorts of local groups um, around these historic high streets that um, from kind of community groups made up of volunteers or more established arts organisations who um, local authorities bid for these grants um, to deliver a series of cultural activities that were in collaboration with the community on the high street. So we've got a lovely picture here in Western Supermare. And this one was a bandstand that was created by um, Morag Myerscroft. Um, and that was loads of performances happened on the high street at this really colourful bandstand, which is at the back there. Um, and all the activities were so diverse. So there was some that were lantern parades um, and there'll be pictures throughout the presentation. I can't talk about them all, but I would love to. Um, uh, and next slide, please. Um, so the aims for the programme shown here is what we will kind of be evaluating against at the end of the programme, which is upcoming, so in March. Um, and uh, you can see here that there's some that's encouraging visits to the high streets, but also re-establishing them as hubs of community and um, supporting creative infrastructure, resilience and showcasing the value of cultural activity to decision makers and, and local stakeholders, but it's always um, rooted in place and heritage. Um, next slide, please. Another one of the lovely high street pictures. Uh, and next one, please. So here we've got some early findings of the evaluation, which is being performed by Amian, who are evaluation consultant. Um, and these um, kind of encouraging statistics show the value of these cultural and community led programs um, in creating a great sense of pride in the high street and local area, feeling more part of their community and visiting the high street for that cultural activity. Um, and this is a sneak peek of the findings. We'll be um, releasing more um, later this year. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and next slide, please. 
I'm going to lightly touch on the National Commissioning Programme. Um, this was a series of commissions with artists and creative organisations across the country, and this was to celebrate the high streets um, alongside that local grants programme. Um, and one of the largest um, being over the four years was a celebra celebratory high street parade with giant puppets touring the country. And this is called High Street Fest. Um, and within these commissions, we followed a co-creative method with communities and uh, lead organisation, Emergency Exit Arts. Um, an example of this is they trained local producers to bring together their local parade and create with local people a, a, a unique puppet inspired by the local heritage um, and joining that parade. So you can see there we've got one, two, three, four, like six. Um, and they were all from the different high streets. Um, and then our lead character, Farah Fox. Um, I, this is a very brief overview of all the kind of um, different national commissions. Um, but if you have a look on our web pages, um, if like high streets, um, heritage action zones, cultural program, you will find them all kind of recorded there. Um, and a lovely toolkit by Emergency Exit Arts on how to host events on the high street as well. So a bit of legacy for that project. And I think that's me. I've got a few extra slides of pictures if we want to go through them. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Harriet. <laughs> um, and just to remind you all, there will be an opportunity to ask these guys questions uh, in, in about five minutes time. But we're going to have one more speaker before we have that opportunity. Um, and that is Asaye from Historic England Archives. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Asaye. I'm the Engagement and Volunteering Officer at the Archive. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> um, so we did a project with um, Age UK Bristol. So it was, sorry, I've got my notes here. Um, so it was one of the projects that we um, worked on um, based on our one of our collections. So in 2022, we um, began a pilot project for one of our collections called the Sir John Pennycook Collection, which you can see on the um, Historic England website. Um, this included developing a series of engagement activities in Bristol. And for one of these, we partnered with Age UK Bristol. So I basically randomly made contact with them. I was thinking of organisations that we could work with and Age UK was um, one that I came, that I was thinking of. Um, and I made contact via the online form and the coordinator from what is called the Friends Aging Better Cafe, um, also known as the Cab Fab Cafe, got in touch with us. So Fab, um, the cafe is basically a community of older people who share what's happening in the city whilst building relationships with like-minded people who live locally. Um, and yeah, Bristol was chosen just because it was just a place. So the part of the collection is it's a it's different sort of street scenes up and down the country. Um, and Bristol was one of the cities which were documented quite heavily. So our manager chose that as a place for us to do those engagement activities. Um, so when we started to work with them, we planned to do monthly sessions with the group over a period of six months. And our first session in, uh, introduced the groups to the Archive and HE and Historic England. And we also asked the group what themes they wanted to explore in future sessions. And participants were basically keen to see images of their hometown, Bristol, um, and places that they had visited and all had connections with um, as children, like, for example, the seaside. Um, and just to let you know, our archive is largely image based. We've got over 40 million items, but they're largely photographs. So they were quite good to use to engage with the participants. And what we pretty much did was print those photos off. We took them on just normal A4 paper and A5, A3, A3 paper. And we took them to the sessions and we were just passing them around. And then we it, those would stimulate discussions and about how like the areas had changed. A lot of them were from the Bedminster area of um, Bristol, which has changed significantly um, since they were young. I um, mean, we learned a lot of, and through being with them, we learned so much about the history of Bristol, history of the area. Um, like there was flooding, I can't remember, 60s or 50s. Um, but a lot of them had loads of stories to talk about and it was a really enjoyable experience for us. And the cafe actually took place in a place called Withywood, which is in the south of Bristol. And it was in a community centre there, which is also a church and just generally a community hub. 
So it was a great location as it was a space the participants were already comfortable with. And it took place in the cafe part of the center. So though it was very, very lively and bustling in there, it worked really well to add to the comfortable nature of the environment and meant that we could also have food and drink at the same time, along with the participants. Often they would be ordering like a full English and like having coffee while we did the event. I think one of the takeaways we had was we didn't realize, I guess for us, how emotional, not in necessarily a sad way, but emotional it would be for us. And, you know, it was, we were developing relationships with these people and we were going, so we were going over a period of six months, once a month, over a six month period. And, you know, they started, they, they knew us, we knew them and they knew our names. And it was like, we built like a strong relationship with them. So that was like a massive takeaway and seeing how, the archive images could be used to engage with others. So yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Jose. Um, so we've got two more speakers to come, but um, to have a little break in the middle of that and to give you a chance to ask these guys some questions, we're going to go to a Q&A um, now for about 20 minutes. And I'll stop sharing my screen as well so people can see everyone. Thank you so much, Finn, and thank you, Ellen, SAA, Gareth, Harriet, for everything that you've just shared with us. Um, so as I said, if you've got any questions, either put them in the chat or use the raise hand function. Um, you can find that uh, at the bottom of your screen, depending on what you're using, um, to just indicate that you've got a question. While people are thinking about this, um, I've got a question for all of you. Oh, uh, Richard has sort of jumped in. Richard, would you like to ask your question? I'm sure it'll be much better formulated than mine. Um, right. Th thank you, Ruth. Yeah, this is a question mainly for the Missing Pieces project, but I think it also connects through to the, uh, uh, the last project we were hearing about. And firstly, is there any kind of moderation or fact checking that controls what comes from the, the people who send in stuff for the missing pieces project? Or is there a danger that, that we'll end up with some false information or almost sort of memories which are a, a, a bit odd? Um, so I wondered about that kind of a, a process of, of actually controlling the quality mm. and then is there any interaction between these projects? So is there interaction between the Missing Pieces project and the Archives Age UK project? Because I can imagine that passing around all these photographs of places in Bristol and, and thereabouts, some of those are going to be places which are on your listed buildings um, list. So do any of those reminiscences feed back and end up on the uh, the missing pieces site? So with your first question, yep, everything that comes into us is moderated because it's um, it doesn't form part of the statutory list entry, but it is attached to it. So it's associated with it. It has to be moderated. So that was one of the stipulations from DCMS when we created the platform. Um, in terms of fact checking, we can't fact check everything because if someone says we just there's just not the resources to fact check everything. So our kind of remit is to keep everything positive. So you know don't don't address anyone negatively in the that can't defend themselves. So often it could it could our greatest fear was that it would be used as a portal to say the local authorities have let this fall into rack and ruin etc cetera, etc cetera. but as a general rule it's really positive or sometimes we would have to reject a comment because they do mention a third person very very rare but you're right everything has to be moderated um with regards to so i wasn't um able to go on to out with the archives but um one thing i have done is i've gone and done missing pieces uh project talks in conjunction with the high street heritage action zones um so recently i did the chard um one of the hs has this did a uh, talk in chart it was it was again it was we asked people to bring in photos so the whole afternoon was a workshop so it basically stimulated that conversation about people remembering going to school and then there was always a certain sweet shop that everyone would go to and 
it was just a really nice positive way for everyone to kind of um, talk about the environment that they remember, but also to celebrate kind of the changes that have happened as well. So it was a really, really nice project, but no, it, there is a, there's a nice crossover with, with everything we do really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Aseo, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, well, and we I just, I guess that we would look to do, we're looking to do more projects similar to this. And there is, so hopefully there'll be more opportunities for us to collaborate. And we're such a massive organisation as well. So sometimes that can I mean we don't always get to work together, but we are hoping to do that in the future. Great, thank you. Martin Wills, um, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, hello everyone, uh, I'm Martin Wills and I work for the Historic Towns Trust, who are an organisation who make historical maps and atlases of uh, towns and cities across England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, just got a quick question for SAA about the project with Age UK. Um, could you just talk to me about a bit about the process of how you partnered with them and, and, and the conversations you had before the project started? Was it very much that you went to them or was there another opportunity that you both kind of mutually were pursuing that you saw the partnership work that way? Yeah, I went directly to them. So they had like a contact form I thought, or an email address. It was a little while ago, but it, there was, I did, from what I recall, I did just contact them and it, I was really lucky. I mean, I contacted a few places. Some didn't get back to me, um, but Age UK did. I think for the Friends Aging Better Cafe, they had the coordinator who was there at the time. She was really um, passionate about getting us to work with them. And there were people within that group who were really interested in history and sort of the history of the, of their of their town of their city and history of in general. So it was quite easy. Sometimes it sometimes it hits, but sometimes it doesn't. I do. I think there were quite a few that just didn't. I didn't hear from. But luckily, Age UK Bristol came back to me quite quickly. Does that answer your question? <laughs> great. Yes. Thank yes. Great. Okay. Thank good, good. You. Okay. Great. Good, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, Victoria, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, Martin mentioned interaction, and as I was um, listening to Gareth talk about the um, Missing Pieces project, I couldn't help thinking about potential interaction between layers of London and Missing Pieces. Um, so just, this was not my question. My question is as follows. <laughs> Um, I am passionately involved with a project in South London at West Norwood Cemetery, which is a grade two star listed cemetery, 19th century, one of the Magnificent Seven. I can talk to you all evening about this, but I won't. In that cemetery, we have had 17 monuments on the Heritage at Risk list. Thanks to a generous grant uh, from... Um, uh, the National Heritage Lottery Fund, Lambeth Council, Historic England, and other people, most of them have now been restored. And going on to, the, to your website, I can see some of them photographed with the um, top in over them and being restored, etc. And I was thinking, would it be okay for us to go in and add the photographs after the restoration, but also add information about the people who are buried in these monuments. Because we have photographs of, of these people, we, we know their life stories, we, and especially one in particular, St. Stephen's Mortuary Chapel, which will now be a cultural center for the whole community of West Norwood and beyond. Uh, people will not know what this St. Stephen's is all about. Um, we can, add this information, beautiful photographs of the ceiling now all repainted and but um, so um, your um, we will be your ish as a result of this <laughs> evening. No, that sounds amazing. I, I um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm really keen for is um, it shows the journey 
of what a what a listed structure can look like and then with some care with some love and some money what it can look like afterwards but i think it's really inspirational for people that are thinking about setting up their own project or set, thinking about setting up their own kind of task to make their local environment better i think it acts as a kind of almost a springboard but definitely motivation and if we can flesh out maybe wrong terminology but if we can add some depth to those um list entries with the history of the people that are there i think it will be an amazing addition it it kind of really does add that missing piece we'll get on with it gareth but um just for the benefit of all of us here this evening just to encourage more people this amazing project wouldn't have even wouldn't even have started had it not been for some determined volunteers who w went on and banged and banged and banged until Lambeth Council heard uh, and then they put together the bid. It, it was all done. I mean, of course, it's six million pounds, it, but it was the project that attracted the funding and the project was put together by these volunteers. I wasn't one of them, so I can I can speak with great pride about them. It took a long time but it did happen a few years back. I mean, 10 years back, it looked like a pie in the sky, but now it's there. And for the whole community, not, not just for the people who are buried there, or because it will be for everybody to share the gardens, the beauty of it, the tranquility of it. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, Gareth. We'll get on with it. Count <laughs> us among your ISA. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, so there are a couple of questions that I'm just going to quickly read out in the chat, which relate to some things that I think Ellen and Finn and I started talking about when we first met to talk about this um, potential of the seminar. So Catherine Pierce has asked, what about people who are new to the areas? Is there a forum to help them feel a sense of belonging? And I think potentially related to this in some instances, there's also a question from Felicity Jones um, about thinking around um, languages and other languages to encourage a kind of broader participation and this is something that we think about with the Victoria County history in terms of you know is it local people writing local history but who are the local people and how long do they need to have been in a place for it to be you know theirs um, so I kind of I think we can throw those questions out broadly to to anybody if they'd like to contribute. I can come in on that. Um, so I think this is an excellent challenge and often one of the misconceptions around historic England that because we're talking about history and heritage, it's from several generations back or sometimes several um, several centuries back. And that isn't the case. Um, makes me feel very old to say that you can list a building from the 90s now. Um, so we are, and, and actually as Sean will talk about some of the everyday heritage um, work that we do is really recent history. Um, so we are, um, so that's the first thing to say is that we are interested in history that, that is um, from recent times and from people who are newly arrived. And the second thing to say is that when we are working on um, projects that are locally delivered, we're always working with um, organisations there who have a connection at grassroots, and very often that will be with people who are newly arrived in a place. So for example, High Street Fest, where you saw the giant fox on the scooter, um, Emergency Exit Arts worked there in those six high streets and worked with a real range, very diverse and varied range of people um, and community groups that included people who had arrived newly in the area and that we've, and from early evaluation, it's showing that that's really helping those people to feel a sense of belonging and contribute their story. And I'm sure I speak for Gareth as well in saying that for missing pieces, we're, we're interested in things that happened yesterday in those places as well. So yes, we want those, those stories as well. Thank you, Ellen. Anybody else wanna kind of chip in on any of that from the perspective of the other projects? No? Okay, Justin, um, I see you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank Victoria for, for bringing up Lays of London, um, which is a project that, that I'm kind of responsible for, for managing in part. Um, I think, yes, it, it would be wonderful to be able to, um, I mean, this raises the idea perhaps of the ability to syndicate um, things like this. There's a huge amount of material already on Lays of London relating to listed places. It might be a benefit to you guys and likewise 
um, being able to pull those things together, perhaps through sort of um, linked open data structure using listing ID numbers, which are already such a big part of Wikidata, for example, would be great. One thing we have had kind of um, feedback from users um, about wanting to better do more of is use things from um, the Historic England archive on Layers of London and finding that the, the only being able to use the embed code um, is a barrier to that. Um, so perhaps that's something we, we might pick up. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that kind of um, active participation through different sort of focused venues, but the ability to benefit from it in a wider context would be, would be amazing. Um, and perhaps also to come back to Richard's comment um, about the um, need to, to police or uh, fact check content. Um, that was always one of the questions that came up with Layers of London um, and the amount of sort of uh, false or, or abusive or um, inappropriate content has been absolutely insignificant to the point of you know, single, single fingers on single hand over five years plus. Um, so actually the kind of the wisdom of the crowd seems to, to do relatively well in this in this um, sense. We have implemented a feedback feature that allow people to comment on other people's responses and those don't get published immediately. Those come to us first. Um, and the vast majority of the time, those are well-natured and positive in, in the way that you've described. Um, so yeah, not the concern that it might have been. It would be helpful to throw that work in. I was, I was gonna say that I've, um... I have looked at Layers of London and I absolutely love it. I think it's I think it's a, a brilliant tool. Um one of the things that and I'm Sean is incredible and we'll go into more detail, but language, going back to language, I'm always concerned about language as a barrier. So the idea that um that active participation can be at the most entry level of this is something that happened in this building at some time. It could have been yesterday, it could have been 100 years ago, but it is that kind of entry level. And it's the idea that heritage means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it's all significant. So if you, if you think about working class heritage, if you think about what we as an organization do, sometimes is not necessarily in line with what the perception is. So at any point that we can work with people like yourself on Layers of London, we you know, would love to. Great, Thanks. thank you very much. Um, Pat has uh, sort of put a question in the, the chat sort of in relation to something um, that was raised earlier. Um, and thank you, Felicity, for what you've added in the chat as well. But Kat says, are you also looking for opportunities to encourage engagement contributions from people who experience their historic environments through disabilities? Uh, shall I jump in here? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean. Uh, uh, you'll hear from me at, at, at some length, i.e. five minutes very shortly, but um, yes, yeah, so uh, the Inclusive Heritage team, which I lead at Historic England, are a new and evolving team. Um, we, uh, we're wanting to explore a lot more than we're currently doing at the moment. One of the big things we're developing at the moment, which will be uh, launched in July, is an online uh, advice hub about inclusive heritage, which is very much aimed at the sector. Um, going to be guidance, resources, case studies, all sorts about um, from the sort of very small things to very big complicated issues um so we'll be looking at uh, one of the big starting points that we'll be looking at probably for a later batch of of resource and guidance is working with the right people to help us develop guidance around addressing all kinds of barriers so uh i'll, I'll talk about some of these when i speak about the everyday heritage grants but um but i think part of what we want to do as a as a team we've got a lot of diverse experience within the team and a lot of lived experience of uh, protected characteristics of facing barriers to get into the sector and, and so on. But we also recognize that part of Historic England's power is in bringing together people who know more. Um, and I think often some of the people that can support us most in creating this guidance um, are people who aren't necessarily heritage bodies, but are organizations who specialize in disability in working with refugees or asylum seekers who work with particular kinds of communities um, or people with particular kinds of needs and, and using that expertise to then think about, well, 
what can we learn from you in terms of how we can advise people and working with these kinds of communities to uh, to uh, to uncover heritage, to get people excited about heritage, but also can we help you to work with the people that you're already working with to um, to use heritage as a tool to meet your aims of working with those those groups as well. So um, we're hoping over the next few months and years to build relationships with the groups who who carry the expertise that we don't uh, or who uh, who uh, build on the expertise that we have. Um, and so, yes, disability is very much at the top of our agenda as well. So, yes, at the moment, can't say much more than that because we don't know yet. We're a growing <laughs> team. But yes, there will be we will be looking at that. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, I'm going to very quickly sneak final question in Finn before we move on um, which was what I was going to ask at the very beginning um, and this is really sparked by um, Harriet what you were saying about um, the kind of the ways in which you're trying to have for this high street project to have a legacy um, and things that can kind of continue once the kind of big funded sparkly project has ended um, and I just would be interested in in various of you talking about that from the kind of big high street project through to the much more smaller scale project that you were talking about as a, like what how do you continue with these things or make sure that they have a kind of um formal outcome or a way in which that information that's been gathered isn't lost or the kind of momentum that's gathered isn't lost how how are you doing that um or what are the challenges to doing that harriet i don't know whether you want to start yeah um so yeah so that there's a lot of content that's come out of the high street heritage action zones which we have tried to kind of um, make sure that we haven't lost by kind of keeping them on, on the website. And also we had a, recently had a um, conference to try and capture, it's called Reimagining High Streets. Um, and it was trying to capture a lot of that learning. So it was, it was sector wide um, heritage and also kind of um, cultural as well and arts. And then also um, some people from the, the high streets as well um, to kind of talk around what's, what's next for the high street um and kind of getting learning from that um and being able to share but it, it is a challenge to kind of make sure that you can hold on to those learnings like internally we're having um kind of meetings around um you know what we've learned from delivering such a huge program uh, and th and there is legacy um going i think there's some coastal high streets happening as well but i don't know if i want to say too much about that um <laughs> i don't know about if you want to carry on with that ellen yeah i would just add uh, you're absolutely right harriet i think the other thing i would add is that when we have these really big programs but also small scale we always have to have an expectation of evaluation even if it's just asking the question what worked well and what would you do differently next time and then it's creating that bank of knowledge which you then feed into either policy, which we can um, feed back into government or local authority or, or share on our website, the Sean's Advice Hub uh, that they mentioned there, um, or feeding it back into future programmes. So um, Harriet mentioned that currently the government's looking at re, uh, recreating, if you like, or using the template of heritage action zones to work in coastal towns around, in, around the coast of England. And a lot of the learnings from the previous Heritage Action Zones programmes will be fed into that. So we're always looking at continuous improvement. I think we are very lucky as a large organisation to have a resource to be able to evaluate. When we grant fund, we always expect our um, grant recipients to evaluate to an extent. Um, but I don't want to kind of just give that very optimistic, unrealistic answer, because I know that it is also a thing that is often under-resourced and not always embedded in from the start. So, but you can, there are lots of very good resources out there. Um, if you go to say a site like the audience agency, there will be lots of resources there around how you can effectively evaluate on very low resources. So um, yeah, it's possible. Um, I, I just wanted to add, looking, looking at that question from another way as well is, we try as much as possible to embed skills development in the projects that we're funding so that people in the community is developing those skills. I think there's a really nice example in the um, uh, High Street Fest uh, program where in each place there was a local producer was trained up in how to run uh, a street festival. So in each of those places, there's still somebody who knows how to recreate that on their own now with that with their skills. They've got that knowledge. And I think that's something um you'll hear about history in the making in a minute um 
where we're trying to upskill young people as well. So hopefully there's legacy through the skills that we embed and we're helping create connections um, through these through these funding projects that that will have legacy beyond the point that our, our funding is over. Um, so yeah, I think it's another way of looking at it. Great. Right, um, before I hand back to Finn, Asaye, did you have anything that you wanted to add on this? Yeah, I think I just wanted to add, I think somebody's asked about longevity of projects. Mm. It is something that we have we have to deal with. I mean, mm. with the Age UK, for example, it was six months and then it ended and we weren't able to go back. Um, my colleague was able to go, did a presentation um, for another history group in Bristol, but because we're a national archive, we have limitations in that sort of regard because we're not working lo locally per se. Um, it is something that we're thinking about and we are concerned about. Um, I think we tried to be quite open from the beginning and say that we are only there for a, you know a limited time, but it is that I remember the last day was quite it was quite difficult. It was really awkward, but it was it was not awkward, but. I guess difficult because you know you're you're going to leave and you don't know if you're going to see people again and there is that emotional aspect which is definitely something to bear in mind with these projects. Yeah I think the emotional labour of co-production is often so kind of um, pushed down or not discussed and um, the the impact of finishing something off and finishing something well is something that that needs to be discussed. Thank you so much for all your responses to all of those questions. So Finn, I'm going to pass back to you um, and then we'll come back for more questions um, in 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Yeah, talking about the emotional labour of co-production, we're going to hear next from two people who are co-producing with us, so they're not directly employed by us, but uh, uh, two people we're going to uh, we co-produce with. So um, I'm just going to share my screen again. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Polly and Emma, who are two of our young advisors, and they're going to be talking about history in the making projects. So it is Polly, you're up first, aren't you? Yes, great. Okay, thank you, Finn. Uh, hi, I'm Polly. Uh, I'm 19, and I'm one of the young advisors for Historic England. Uh, so I'm just here today to talk a bit about what being your advisor is. Uh, so the Young Advisors are a group of 11 young people uh, aged 18 to 25 from all across the UK. Uh, we tend to meet every six weeks on Zoom. We've met in person once, but it's quite difficult because we live quite far apart. Uh, so we tend to meet every six weeks unless we have a project going on, which uh, Emma will talk about in a bit. But yeah, we're all at quite different stages of work and education. So some of us are in uni, uh, some of us have jobs. Uh, but we're all quite similar in that we share a very similar passion for history, for heritage, obviously, and for culture. Uh, so for me personally, i am just started my first year uh, studying history at the University of Manchester. Uh, and for me, I just joined it because I thought it's a really great opportunity to meet like people in the heritage sector firsthand. Uh, it's kind of, I think it's quite a hard like workplace to crack into. Uh, and so for me to be able to like meet people firsthand, make connections with people like Finn and the other people I've been able to work with uh, has been really excellent. And just kind of learning what it like what it is to work in this in this experience. Um, I've also, yeah, it's also been really great in meeting other people like me, young people who are actively pursuing heritage jobs. Uh, and we're a very, like, we're a very collaborative team. Uh, it's been really great to collaborate with everyone. Uh, yeah, which is another benefit of it, I think. Uh, I also put, yeah, uh, it's a really good experience with skills like project managing, uh, like project planning, handling finances, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, it's been like, I think it's a lot of responsibility, which as young people, we don't often get the chance to do something as tangible as like our main project, which Emma will also talk about later, uh, has been like a grant project, which is like handling actual money and giving it to people, which I think, I mean, I'm only 19. I've never had an opportunity to do something like that. Uh, so yeah, I think that's been really excellent. And I think that that's something that young people should get the chance to do more. So I think overall, the fact that Historic England have allowed us to do this has been quite eye-opening, uh, both for us and hopefully for the people in charge of this project. Uh, yeah. My last point was about diversity. Uh, we're a very diverse group. And I think all of us have a really like, a real interest in diversifying and changing the face of the heritage sector. Uh, when we were doing the grant project, uh, we looked a lot in depth at subjects like colonial language in like museums and written histories uh, and how we can kind of recenter and refocus these histories to make them more inclusive um, for the modern day. So yeah, I think that's about it. Um, and yeah, our main project has been a grant project called History in the Making, which my co-worker Emma will explain in a second. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Thanks, Polly. 
Over to you, Emma. So, hi, uh, I'm Emma. I'm another one of the Young Advisors. Um, I'll just be talking a bit about history in the making. Um, so this is a project that's currently going on in the north of England over the next year or so. It's a youth-led programme that's working with communities to create place markers that celebrate local hidden histories. So these place markers are kind of like the blue plaque schemes, um, but they can be anything from murals to zines to artworks. Um, we really wanted to give communities the power to create place markers that felt really relevant to them and were unique to their community, rather than just plaques that can be found anywhere, basically. Um, so the successful projects are ongoing. Um, it's also going to be expanded, which should hopefully happen later this year. So 11 projects were funded out of the 35 applications we received. Um, and as young advisors, we were involved in selecting these projects that were going to be funded. So we did this individually at first by scoring and ranking each project. And then we discussed as a group the merits of each one. This, I think as Polly has already kind of touched on, it was a really great opportunity to learn a bit about how funding works and has given us a lot of really valuable skills for future job applications as well, including things like decision making, uh, understanding budgets, collaboration, just to name a few. It also meant that we as a youth voice were deciding on which projects had the strongest commitment to young people. That was sort of our um, priority when we were sifting through the applications. Historic England really gave us a lot of control over that decision-making process um, as well. And it was really great to know that our opinions were being valued and actioned as well. I think there were a lot of really interesting and creative projects that I could talk about, but one of my personal favorites is called Byron and On and On, which aims to explore notable residents of Horden in County Durham, um, other than just Lord Byron. So this town has a lot of markers celebrating him already, but lots of residents felt that there were loads of other people who were equally as interesting, so should have their own markers, and that's why the scheme was uh, developed. So they are going to be researching these projects and creating new plaques to commemorate these people. Another favourite is When You Were Me, which connects older and younger LGBTQ plus people to share experiences and celebrate the diversity of Newcastle, all while creating new safe spaces for queer youth in the city as well. I feel like both of these projects have a really strong youth voice and are really doing um, good work to uncover some hidden histories as well. Um, all of the projects are really exciting. It was really hard to choose just 11 of them and myself and the rest of the Young Advisors can't wait to see the results of the projects. Um, so that is our brief overview of what we are as Young Advisors. Um, so thank you for listening. Me and Polly will be around at the end for any questions as well. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you. Um, so we're going to carry on to our next and final presentation uh, and that is from Sean. Uh, hello everyone. Um, so apologies first of all that this is a very text heavy series of slides. Um, I'm not going to read them all and nor do I expect you to but I'm happy to make them available afterwards but hopefully it will be useful stuff. So just a very quick overview of uh, the team I mentioned already. Uh, the Inclusive Heritage team is a very new team um, it's perhaps a bit more sector facing than a lot of my uh, uh, the other teams that we've met so far from uh, from uh, communications and public engagement. Um, so we uh, our aim is to support the sector to become more uh, inc to become more diverse as a sector, but also to celebrate and recognise more uh, inclusive and diverse heritage as well. Um, lots of our work that we're doing responds to the Historic Environment Forum Sector Resilience Plan. So the creation of an advice hub, as I mentioned, some work on data collection, some work on uh, diversity of governance roles across the sector, um, but uh, but this this one in particular is responding to an internal need for us to think about different ways of of running grants programs from Historic England. Um, so a big part of this was uh, developing a new application form, which sounds fairly simple, but um, but was was very much like reinventing the wheel in many ways, but. Um, but we worked with a neurodiversity expert to help us create a more straightforward, accessible form. We were essentially thinking, let, let's aim these projects at people who don't uh, haven't applied for funding from us before, haven't maybe even applied for heritage funding before, don't have the resources to have a bid writer on staff that could do this sort of thing. Um, but, uh, but yes, if we can have the first slide. Um, so I thought instead of thinking, uh, I, I would love to give you a showcase of all the projects that we funded so far, but we'd be here till midnight. So instead, I thought I'd focus on some of the criteria and what it was we were asking from part, from applicants and of the projects and also the kind of uh, guidance we provided them before they applied. 
Um, so the Everyday Heritage Grounds have been a really, really big media story for Historic England, which is lovely. Um, it's also been our most successful grant call, um, if we ignore the COVID recovery fund, which I think seems like an unfair competition because those were quite uh, extreme circumstances. So let's just say it's been the most successful grant call we've done. But in spite of it being a great public engagement moment for us, it's about capacity building. It's about trying new things. Um, it's about encouraging new ways of working. Um, and it's very, very much an evolving uh, evolving process. We're on the second round. We've just uh, announced funding earlier in the year for the second round of this. We're running another round uh, in August. You may well be the first people who know about this, uh, but we're running a third round in August. The theme may or may not change or be tweaked slightly. But basically these are about community co-created projects that celebrate uh, working class stories and history uh, that are very, very much place-based. So there's a few stats there about how much, uh, what the reach of this has been so far. It's been really, really, really uh, popular grant program. But for me, the, my favorite statistic is from the second round of grants. We forgot to collect this data in the first round. Um, in the second round um, of the, I think it was about 380 applicants we had in the second round, 90% of the applicants had never been funded by Historic England before, which felt like a really huge victory uh, for us. Also notably, the, the majority of uh, projects uh, that, that uh, of applicants and of the projects that we funded were not from heritage organisations. They were from, from organisations uh, that wanted to use heritage to meet their own outcomes, as well as the ones that we'd asked for as well. So loads of uh, neurodiversity charities, loads of organisations that support um, people uh, with uh, that uh, rely on substances, substances, people that uh, are learning disabled, um, so, and, they, and they want to find ways to use heritage. Some of them that are based in historic buildings, so want to talk about the places that they actually run those services from. Really great range of, of projects. Um, so one of one of the aims is a selfish aim, which is that we want these projects to help Historic England to understand a broader range of heritage and to recognise that as well. But we're very, very key, keen on stressing that these projects are about um, process. Um, yes, we want great outcomes uh, or outputs, rather. We're more concerned about what the process is, how you get there and what the participants get out of it. Um, so if you could have the next slide, please. So those are those. A, a lot of criteria, not not too much, a reasonable amount of criteria. This is the criteria that was scored. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the projects were meaningfully co-created. Uh, we wanted to show that, uh, we wanted the organisations to show, or individuals to show that they'd thought about potential barriers for why people might not be able to get engaged with those projects. Um, we want, and and to suggest how they would overcome those. Um, we, would, we wanted them to be able to demonstrate what the impact on people would be involved in. So I won't talk much about this, but this was very much leaning on Historic England's wellbeing strategy, um, thinking about uh, wellbeing in terms of mental health, access to nature, um, meeting people, but also it could be skills building, all sorts of things. And then a, a fairly generic one, which is which we have to, as the kids' public money, we have to uh, assess against all of them, which is, is this project realistic? Um, next slide, please. Um, so in doing this, we in the second round, we produced this guidance for uh, about co-creation and um, the uh, we didn't do this the first time around. Uh, we did it the second time around because people interpreted co-creation in many different ways. And we basically constructed this list of what co-creation is and isn't from our perspective um based on successful and unsuccessful applicants from the applications from the first one there were lots of projects that assumed that because they involved a lot of people that that was co-created but actually nine times out of ten it was a historian or a curator who'd already planned what the project was going to be but would be kind of uh was thinking about their audience as participants or was thinking about the subject of their work as participants so we really tried to specify this is what we mean when we say co-creation and this is how we'll be we'll be judging it. This is what we don't mean. Um, and the second time around with this guidance, there were much fewer uh, projects that, that didn't get it and, and weren't thinking uh, more carefully about how they were including people in a really meaningful way in decision making, in, in shaping the process, in shaping the outcomes. And some of the uh, a lot of the successful uh, projects uh, that we funded um, didn't specify any out outputs. Uh, they said, this is, we, we haven't started this co-creation pro process yet, so we don't know 
it might be that we'll uh, we'll create a film. It might be that we'll create a heritage trail. It might be that we put on a play. It depends. But they'd also kind of budgeted accordingly for the fact that there were some unknowns about what the uh, the outputs might be. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And um, so the other thing that's that we scored very very highly was about thinking about barriers. So um, the at their core, the, this grant is being run by the Inclusive Heritage Team. At its core, these grants are about inclusion, uh, not just about inclusive heritage. Uh, we uh, we chose working class as a theme because we thought it was broad enough, um, but also addressing uh, an area that perhaps Historic England's not as well known for celebrating. Um, and also um, because a lot of people with uh, marginalised, uh, a lot of marginalised communities are more likely to be uh, in lower income uh, areas, are more likely to be in working class jobs or from working class backgrounds. Um, so uh, what we um, what we did is we said, tell us um, how you will address some of the barriers that might be faced by potential participants in your projects. And we, we came up with this list. We might not present this in the same way for the next round, uh, because what we found was that people would just reproduce this list and give an answer for each of them, which showed that they hadn't really thought about how they're going to address these. And you know, if if um, if if they were if they'd said that they were working with uh, you know uh, young people, um, they needn't necessarily be talking. You know, if they're saying they're working with like young adults, they needn't necessarily be talking about this thing or that thing. If they they know they're only working with a particular community, they don't need to acknowledge all of these. Some of the projects that scored most highly on this might have only mentioned one of these barriers, but have really thoroughly spoken about how they would work with that community. So one uh, one example of that, there's a project uh, 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 that's based on a, a, a squat that used to be occupied by uh, a Rastafari community. Um, the person or the organisation who are leading on this project demonstrated that they so fully are part of that community and know that community so well that they can anticipate the barriers really, really well. So they didn't talk about um, they didn't talk about uh, physical barriers, although, you know, they, 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 they very well could have. They didn't talk about childcare. What they talked about was some of the, the cultural barriers and the barriers of perception. Um, they said that, you know, the community in that particular area are a little bit distrustful of institutions. Um, so, you know, because of the good relationship we have with them, we're going to do this, this, this and this. So we were looking for um, the quality of how they address barriers rather than we're trying to address all of these because we have to also be realistic. So uh, this is just a sense of the way this just to give you an overview of the way that we were um, we were doing this. This is still an evolving thing the, the criteria will be changed for the third round. The way that we're um, giving guidance for this will be changed in the third round. But um, but so far, it feels like a success. What we haven't been great at doing so far is is doing exactly what Ellen was talking about uh, earlier, which the other projects have been doing better, which is getting any real data from it. So we've done a bit of research in the, into the first round, which was mainly about how the organizations found the application process um, and uh, the support that they got from us. We haven't looked at impact on the participants yet. Um, we haven't done anything since, but we obviously we always collect evaluation from, from the projects that are evaluating their own work. Um, we get them to do closure reports and highlight reports where we ask very specific questions. So we can get a lot of data in quite a passive way but what uh, we really are keen to develop in the next round is to think a bit more about what it is we need to get out of this from a sort of evaluation perspective as well. So it's a very whistle stop tour. I'll share a link in the uh, in the chat that shows you the projects that we funded so far. Um, if you do want to sort of have a browse through the kind of the variety that we funded, um, and I think that's probably all from me. Thank, thanks, Sean. Great. Um, okay, that is that's all the speakers we've got. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Great, um, thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. Um, I think a round of applause for all those various and um, really interesting insights into everything that's been happening. Um, we've now got some more time for questions. Um, I'm just going to pick up on one kind of question in the chat that Felicity has asked, which is a kind of uh, like a specific factual question almost. Um, so this is for Sean. Did you explicitly promote the Everyday Heritage Programme in non-heritage sectors, given that the range of applications and grants is so impressive? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, we did promote it, but not... Uh, so we uh, we went through sort of usual heritage sector channels, um, at, but then we, it was mainly picked up through the media. So uh, in the second round, we did record where people had heard about the grants, um, and it was overwhelmingly through MP engagement. 
Um, and at Historic England, we have a team who, who you know, one of their, their key functions is to to engage uh, local MPs with our with our work. Um, a lot of it was through local authority kind of, uh, you know, that it was picked up. It was largely picked up, I would say, through MPs and local authority kind of means of communication. Um, I, I don't quite know. I'm, I'm not sort of savvy enough with the comms and media to know how it gets to them. But we didn't necessarily do any targeted uh, promotion outside of it. The thing is, they they were picked up very, very well in local radio, on local radio stations, especially probably more so than a lot of other projects that we do. Um, even at the point where we were just announcing that the funding was available, where there's less to, you'd think seemingly from a local interest perspective, there's not much to report on at that point. So maybe it was from, because it was picked up more on a local level than on a national level that it, that it did well. Um, Ellen, I don't know if you have any thoughts compared to kind of other projects. Yeah, so this is so um, intense. Another useful thing you might want to look at is our audience segmentation that we that we have available. And I think that um, when people who are really engaged in local heritage, they will often be really interested in, they will listen to local radio and they will watch local TV. So that's one way to get to, to them and really engage that audience. And then on MPs as well, I think people follow MPs on social media if they're engaged in that way because they want to get to their local MP and they're interested in what they've got to say and that's why MPs are always looking for positive content as well because they want to show that they're working very hard for their constituents and so you, it naturally follows that the audience that follow a local MP will likely be more engaged um, to, to take part in this kind of thing. Um, it's really interesting to, to kind of unpick how people uh, engage on that local level as well. Great, thank you. Um, the other question that's in the chat was from Claire. Um, Claire, I don't know if you're still in the room, um, but I think this is a really important question that Claire has raised around some of the language that we've been using today. So she said, I'm not personally seeing co-production or community-led research. I'd go with community produced with and HE led. Um, so do we need to build um agreed definitions in the sector? What about what we're how we're talking about different things? Um, and I think I think this evening we've seen a sort of spectrum of different projects that have different kind of emphasis on community and HE and local members and you know um young people and different things like that. Um so yeah, I sort of throw that out there in terms of how are we using this language and how are you using that language and also in terms of communicating you know Sean it was really interesting that you had that list of this is what co-production is and this is what co-production isn't um you know uh, how is this being communicated to the people who need to know at the moments they need to know um yeah I could come in there I think it's really tricky I think you can get into very complex linguistic debates about what we mean with all of these things um, and to some extent, I think if we're doing this work really well, you almost need to renegotiate that every time you take on a project. Because I think there are times where um, maybe maybe we have the skills in Historic England, maybe we've got great graphic designers or historians that can fill a gap that a community doesn't have, but the community can really provide other inputs and expertise that, that we can't provide. And I think, yeah, we can get into sort of co-creation, co-production, co-design, all these conversations that I think it is important to define what we mean at the beginning of these projects but I I, I also think it is something that continually evolves and um, I'm always sort of yeah I kind of I don't get try not to get too bogged down in, in the linguistics of it uh, but I think it's very important when you enter these projects that um, that that there is an agreement of what it is you mean with that specific partner in that specific moment that specific project um, and that you're all agreed that that's going to meet your collective aims so um yeah that's maybe a cop out from trying to define what everything is but i think across the projects we've all discussed there's a, there's a real spectrum of, of things here um yeah yeah and i would i would just add to that i think this is sort of slightly the limitation of, of a kind of five slides five minutes each which is good to give the range but i think um to finn's point it is a bit of a sliding scale so the cultural program for example is the largest ever community-led arts and heritage program and we gave six million pounds out in grants specifically for um, community-led local cultural organizations to work with local people to decide what happened on their high streets and we didn't and again a bit like everyday heritage um that was not defined before we grant funded uh, likewise, High Street Fest, Emergency Exit Arts, who are experts on co-creation with communities, 
worked on those six high streets for about two and a half years with different people. Um, and the host puppets that you see are completely envisaged and the parades that took place are completely envisaged by local people there. History in the Making, again, is another example where those youth-led organisations are working with young people to completely define, first of all, what the local heritage is, the story that young people want to talk about, and then also how that manifests itself physically. But of course, there are other examples. For example, um, Missing Pieces is an, a, a de an already defined offer where we want people to engage. And likewise, say, Aseye's example of of the archive, we have a finite collection and we really want to hear stories about that. So I think it's important that we, that we much to Finn's point, allow ourselves to, um, to have different projects with different scales of co-production and co-creation. Um, and the short answer to your question is, yes, I think that it would be useful to have shared definitions. And I think Everyday Heritage Grants was a really, that was a really useful thing to come out of that in terms of what do we mean when we talk about co-creation and co-production? And uh, and I'll let Sean pick up on that. Yeah, Sean, please do. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, just a few thoughts. I, I think uh, perhaps more so with the Everyday Heritage Grants, but I think in a way we're giving over our definition. As soon as we give the money, we're also giving the defining of co-creation over to the yeah. organisations that are, are leading it. And, and by the end of the project, certainly with the first round, there are some of them where we're just like, well, that wasn't really co-creation, was it? And there are others where, like, wow, this is like game-changing approach to, uh, to, to you know, putting all of the power into the community participants' hands. Um, and sometimes you are funding the community. So whatever that organisation is coming up with, that organisation is the community who's co-creating co co that, um, that, 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 uh, that project. I think also there's something, and I, probably probably don't have time to go into it, but there's something as well around, especially when you're as a as a grant giver for co-created projects there's a there's an element of how comfortable as a grant body you are with risk around co-creation and it feels um so with, with history in the making for example we know that the outcome will be a place marker outside of that it could be any number of things with everyday heritage grants we're saying you know what we want to see from it is uh, improved well-being is, uh, you know, is participants getting something meaningful out of it? Is is people feeling more connected to their local places? These kind of quite abstract, intangible things, with the expectation that yes, probably there is going to be something tangible as well. And I, it's great that Historic England is comfortable with that risk. Th there's probably a, a line though, because it's public money as well, and I, th I think there has to be a, a sense of how much you know to what extent is something open-ended if if you accept a particular de definition of co-creation i'm not sure if that's useful or as articulate as i hoped it would be but um but yes that's a thought anyway yeah and that's um i think that point about public money is also um a really interesting one in terms of think you know as uh as speaking as an academic and applying for different pots of money that different funding bodies will have different levels of risk and expectation and what you were saying about outputs and um that that ability to be like we actually don't know what the output is going to be currently within academic funding that's very difficult to take that position and to say we're going to be doing co-production and therefore we don't exactly know where this is going to go um so yeah it's um it, it's really interesting uh great or, victoria or, or that it oh. might fail sorry all that it might fail fail yeah that you might get not might not get anything from it um which i think goes back as well to asaye's point earlier about those risks of um approaching people and sometimes it will come off and sometimes it won't and sometimes you know these things will fly and that the community will be really engaged and sometimes it just won't really hit the mark yeah victoria sorry that's okay. Um, Sean, I was I was delighted to hear you talk about cultural barriers and barriers of perception because before, and I'm sure this is the case uh, across the room, but especially now I can only talk about our case. Um, before we move on to co-production and, and co-creation, we need to make people included. We, we want to make them feel part of their heritage. Now, West Norwood is perceived by, by many people as um, a cemetery for the great and the good. We have even Mrs. Mrs. Beaton in there. We have Let's Diaries. We have, you know, 300 names from the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. But we also have 
normal, common people. Now, in order to overcome this perception and these barriers, I mean, I'm I'm a trustee of the Friends of West Norwood, and in among the trustees and among the Friends of West Norwood, we have had dozens of of um, uh, ideas for co-production and co-creation projects. But in order to go through and break these barriers, we have thought of two in particular. And I wanted to ask you, because this is a chicken and egg kind of situation here. And I one of the ideas is to get together a group of people from the estates around this magnificent Victorian cemetery to the local library and run the MOOC in Applied Public History, of which I'm a great fan. Now, I know that people around that area will never even think of a MOOC, the Applied Public History, what is all this? What does it concern? But I know that if I can get, if we can get a group of 10 people that will come in over six weeks in the library and do that course, by the end, we will have a, 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 a core community of volunteers and ambassadors from the estates to break down the barriers. The second project would be um, a, a schools project, which doesn't exist. Now, a schools project will get into all the houses, will get into all the schools, and will get all over the place. So are these projects that could come an, under your funding? I, th I think they're both great suggestions, uh, and potentially, yes. Uh, I, I don't see why not. I think the, the, um, the first one, I think, the the core of that idea is um the best ambassadors are the people that you're trying to uh, attract there so i think your instinct is right there um I, th I think part of me thinks is is having done a free course enough of an incentive to get probably working people to to attend for such a long period of time or is there funding that can allow for maybe some payment as well and seeing it as actually you're doing us a service as well as as you getting something out of this well, um, it, it would be, you know, in the local library that the, the, the money needed would be to hire the rooms and give some tea and and it, and it could be in the evenings, you know, it could it could be, but it's a, it's a chicken egg kind of thing. We, 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 we will have to kind of try and feel our way. It, I don't think MOOC in applied, in applied public history has ever been done this way before. Uh, it's normally somebody at home in front of a screen. But in order to encourage people to look into co-production co and to see what's in it for them, you need to take it to them. But if it's in the local library, you can attract people via the library, mothers who come to the library with children or other people, fathers or whoever, older people who come to read their newspaper, people who go to the movies there. You know, if it's in the local library, you have access to the wider community. Anyway, I, I think I, that, oh, sorry, very much the time, but just to say that I think it, it, I think your instincts are absolutely right here. I think I, what I would say is I think if if engaging with a local heritage site is a barrier, then I think so too are something that's probably seen as quite an academic thing, and so too is a library. So I think that there's more there's more work to be done before that stage. But yeah, I think I think your instincts are absolutely right. Thank you very much, both Sean and Victoria. And um, I've put the link to the, the MOOC in Applied Public History that was developed um, in the Centre for the People, um, Centre for the History of People, Place and Community a few years ago now um, in the chat for anyone who's interested. But I think that Sean's raised a really important point there about you know where our starting point is in terms of what we expect people to be interested in and to engage with and how we think through carefully those kind of barriers to engagement. Um, now, I just wanted to give Asay a quick opportunity to um, say something about how we access the, um, what was that, four, four million, four, four, you, you, you 14 mean, million, four, over it, like, 14. It was just an amazing number of things that are in your archive. So, yeah, quickly, please do tell us how we could access that. Oh, yes. So, um, usually on our, on our website, we'll have, so, I'm oh, sorry, I can actually, luckily, I've got it right up here. 
you can search images here. I only wanted to chime in because I know somebody mentioned about earlier about wanting to use images for layers of London. I don't, I'm not, I will just admit my role, I can't <laughs> make it happen necessarily, but I can find out more about it. So also I wanted to just, if you do want to get into contact with me and the archive in general, I will just put my email address in the chat so you can do that. But the search box I've put there is basically the archive page and how you can find images and there's images over the whole country. But yeah, I'll also put, if you have any questions about anything I spoke about or anything like that, um, I'll just put my email address in the chat. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I think we're going to have to wrap it all up now to make sure that we finish by seven o'clock. But huge thank you to all of our speakers. Um, this has been a really wonderful seminar. Thank you for coming.